So, Marcus Nevins, I'm head of services for a company called Grey Matter, based in Ash Burton. We're a very large Microsoft partner, but we also work with Alibaba Cloud and AWS. I'm going to focus on Azure in this particular instance, but yeah, this also with all the concepts I'm going through today will also apply to AWS and Alibaba Cloud. So, we're just going to go through an overview of what, what Azure is. Quick show of hands who's using Microsoft Azure at the moment. Stuff. So yeah, quite a lot of people, that's good. Um, we're going to have a view of some security services that you can adopt and uh, do a couple of demos as well. So just looking at the overview, um, Azure at the moment, Microsoft are investing billions in their cloud platform. At the moment it's really their big bet. And the moment there's 54 Azure regions. The slide kind of gives a good representation of, of how much there really is. 2 million kilometers of intraday center fiber, and you can achieve 72 characters per second backbone. There's 54 announced regions, there's actually about 46 or 8 that, that you can actually use at the moment. Over 100 data centers and literally millions of servers. Now, what Microsoft tend to do is for each geopolitical region, so say the UK or uh, Europe, for example, they have at least two regions available. So. If you wanted geo-replicated backups or DR scenarios, you can ensure that your data is kept in the same region, so uh, not the same geopolitical region. On top of that, within each region, typically you have multiple availability zones, so it's the same for AWS and Alibaba Cloud. When you have a single region, that doesn't mean just one data center, but you'll have two or three, and they'll be separated by hundreds of kilometers for that enhanced redundancy. <coughs> And from a compliance perspective, Microsoft are one of the leaders in the quantity of the compliance they have globally. This is just some, I think there's about 90 at the moment now, and they continue to achieve more. So this is an overview of the amount of native cloud services that you can adopt within Azure at the moment. I say native because there's hundreds of third-party vendors and partners who put their solutions in from a security perspective. These can be Barracuda firewalls, web application firewalls, um, yeah, and, and many, many other signed solutions. Um, most cloud platforms, look at the bottom here, you know, there's infrastructure services, so these are like your virtual networks, your virtual machines. When Microsoft are leaders in our RAM platform services, there's lots of native built-in services that developers and organizations and corporations can adopt <coughs> to, make, to really take advantage of that flexibility and scalability of the cloud. Focus on security, so these are most of the security solutions and features you're able to adopt as part of the Azure platform at the moment. Everything from network security, infrastructure security, encryption, and configuration management. And again, with all cloud platforms, there's a shared responsibility model. So, <coughs> Microsoft, or AWS, or Alibaba, you know, they'll ensure that your physical assets and data centers are secured, and also their responsibility for that. When you deploy your virtual machines, it's your responsibility to keep them up to date, keep, keep your virtual network secure, and your data encrypted. So, Microsoft use what they call is the uh, Azure security model to strengthen their security posture on the platform. And this is broken into three areas. So you have a secure foundation, so the actual physical assets and how they, they secure that in their data centers. You have built-in control, so the user consumer can take advantage of all the, the features I mentioned a moment ago to secure your solutions. And on top of that, they layer features like security center and ATP, how to machine learning to further adopt more secure environments. So look at the secure foundation. So all of Microsoft data centers adopt world leading security practices. This is coupled with traditional practices like big walls and fences and all sorts. Um, a colleague of mine was actually at the Dublin data center, which is West Europe, um, quite recently, and they now give them the badge. So if your badge changes color, they actually use, because you've been there for a long time, so an hour over or whatever, you'll visit, you'll actually um, be picked up by CCTV and they use cognitive services to automatically pick that up and they'll send security teams in to, uh, to score you out. There's also, in terms of operation security, you know, 24-7 monitoring, there's thousands of global security experts that are constantly 
you know, challenging and, and, and uh, ensuring that everything is really secure as possible. And there's also multi activities going on all the time to try and find vulnerabilities before obviously the bad guys do. So building controls, so this is where you consumer can adopt the controls, which I mentioned earlier, to enhance your security, whether on infrastructure services, servers, computer, or platform services. There are five kind of areas that we'll go into a bit more detail, but as I mentioned earlier, there's, uh, there's integrated partner solutions as well that can enhance your security posture further. As I mentioned, Microsoft utilised things like machine learning and threat intelligence to enhance features like Microsoft Security Center and Azure ATP to alert you, analyse data and uh, yeah, identify threats. So looking in a bit more detail into identity and access management, as an example, most organisations will have on-premises attribution domain services. A common way to get those identities into the cloud now is to utilise something called AD Connect. So the, you can deploy this AD Connect service to securely replicate users and routes up into Azure AD and synchronise the password hash so you're using Stephen Asylum for those cloud-based services. <coughs> Once your identities are in the cloud, you can then utilise those to authenticate against cloud services like you know, Facebook, Google, whatever, or even your own custom developed applications, Office 365, Intune, all that good stuff. There is role-based access control built into the, the, uh, the, the ground up the whole solution. So you'll have an Azure Active Directory tenant, and within that you can have multiple subscriptions for all your resources. Uh, you can implement custom roles and role definitions assigned to resource groups, subscriptions, or even individual resources to give that fine-grained access control. There's something called uh, Azure Directory Conditional Access. So this is a premium feature of <coughs> the EMS suite. Essentially, you could say, if someone's trying to access my, my Azure portal and they're from China, they're not going to get in. You can have more advanced criteria. You can have risk-based analytics powered by machine learning to say, you know, if this access request is from an untrusted device, but it's from a trusted location, from a trusted user, they might come in, might allow it in, but, you know, there's, yeah, slightly risk, network location, and device client management involved in that to assess the, uh, the security vulnerabilities. You can do multi-factor authentication, um, and of course, also adopt privileged identity management. So this allows for just-in-time access to the portal. So say you don't want to give all of your engineers global admin to absolutely everything, you can enable them with least privileged and give them privileged identity management to access resources on a just-in-time basis. So look at the data protection, we just want the key concept of security. So most data that you deploy into Azure uses uh, Azure Storage Service Encryption, so it's powered by AES 256 bits encryption. Um, for example, when you have a managed disk for a virtual machine, they're automatically encrypted. Mm -hmm. When you're using Azure SQL, that supports both TDE encryption, which is on by default, and you can further secure that using what is encrypted. You can utilize Key Vault, which is the secure, uh, essentially a cloud HSM in the AWS world, so you put into that. You can store your keys securely and use those keys to reference um, access to databases using more encrypted. And network security. So there's virtual networks in Azure, if you're producing infrastructure services, you have the concept of network security groups. So these are logical access controllers that you can utilize to essentially put logical firewalls around resources. So you can say, if you have a web server, put a network security group on it to say, only HTTPS is allowed in, for example, etc. And these can be applied not only to virtual machines, but also subnets and virtual networks as well. You have the ability to utilize virtual private networks. So if you have a hybrid deployment, so you've got on-premises network, you can deploy IPsec site-to-site -site VPNs to securely transmit that, that network traffic by being uh, going over the public network. Um, you can utilize Express Route, which is a private network connection, a bit like NPLS on-prem. 
DDoS protection is included by default, so when you spin up a virtual network, you do have the basic DDoS protection as part of the, the fabric which Microsoft provides. And there are other features like web application firewalls, there's native ones available within Azure, like the application gateway. Uh, you have the Azure firewalls as well, but like I said, there's lots of third parties who provide those solutions to enhance your security posture. So, more recently, Microsoft have really been investing into more enhanced security solutions powered by machine learning, uh, etc. So, Security Center has come a long way in recent years. Um, you have Mars Analytics who can take <coughs> and basically monitor all your resources, whether it's virtual networks, virtual machines, applications, data, and report them into the Security Center and they'll put back out reports and recommendations on how you can help your security posture. And you can get nice scores as well, make it nice and easy. And that helps you mitigate potential vulnerabilities proactively, so you can automate patch delivery to your virtual machines. Um, you can plug holes that are open on your network, um, and yet yeah, you can wipe these applications and uh, yeah, generally make things a lot more secure. <coughs> And what you can also do for the security center, in combination with Azure Monitor, which is the Azure default monitoring solution, you can utilize Vent Hub as well and put this into sign solutions. So, uh, Sentinel was released quite recently uh, in the past, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago now. So, this is Microsoft's first sign solution essentially. And you can export all these logs using Log Analytics and the workspace into the central repository, and then you can further harden your security by being able to alert all these. So as I say, security and privacy are built right into the platform. There's Microsoft provides three kind of security resources available for consumers as well as their, their own consumption as well. I mentioned the security center, so that's there available for people who want to adopt the platform. But there's also the security development lifecycle. So this addresses security at every deployment phase to ensure that Azure continue updates to make it more secure. The Operational Security Assurance Framework is a further adoption of that. So looking at that in a bit more detail, this is the DSDL, so this is essentially the framework that Microsoft worked to as well as they yeah, put out recommendations for, for the consumers to work this as well, and it's best practices involved in focus around security and how you can enhance security to your solutions from uh, yeah, various different, different ways. And the OSA is very similar, but it's more operational, so the likes of pen testing, MFA, these privileges, etc. So, <coughs> just got a couple of uh, reference architectures just to go over with you as an example. So, these are all based on infrastructure services, so virtual networks, VMs, storage accounts, etc. So, this is a typical scenario uh, for a, a hybrid topology. So, my pen's not working very well, but on the left here you can see the on premises network, and you have two firewalls here. Now, this is like slight VPN. You have user defined routing, what that is. So, when you provision a virtual network by default and you put a virtual machine into that, by default, Microsoft will take care of all of the network routing for you. So, this VM will just be able to go out to the internet. You really want to harden your network using NSGs, firewalls. Where user-defined routing comes in is you can have custom route tables on your virtual network to say, I want all traffic, my whole VNet to go to a specific network line, so I'll typically be a firewall. So in this scenario, uh, this here we have two NDAs, so they're network virtual appliances in uh, Microsoft Free they can do. So you have a pair at the top for the, uh, so redundant pair for the private DMZ. So this is the you know, user find route, all traffic coming from on-prem is going to hit this, hit the user find route and hit the, um, the load balance of fronting the two MBAs. So this could be a Cisco uh, appliance or Barracuda CGF, whatever. And then 
Both the uh, the NICs on the on the uh, VMs both paired NICs are one private DMZ in, so the the, the uh, red zone and in the DMZ out, so the complete segregation here. Each one of those NSGs can be their own subnet. So you have the ability to spin up multiple subnets as long as they fit within your address space of your virtual network. Your actual applications here, here. So after traffic passes securely through the firewall, you know these users on prem might be able to access the web tier. So again, the web tier could be your online business web application. These could also be a scale set, so you have the ability to dynamically scale based on utilization, which is good because in the cloud you pay for what you consume, and you have the flexibility to scale back in again as well. Um, but yeah, for each uh, oops, for each tier, web tier, business logic, and back end data tier, you have separate subnets and network security groups fronted by low balance as well. Got a keyboard here that can be used for securing uh, keys for your application and also for always encrypted and TD encryption within this uh, this could be SQL Server, for example, always on the On the bottom here, we could have a some example, this could be a pair of Barracuda web application firewalls, for example. So if you wanted to securely expose your uh, website to the internet, you can front the internet traffic. Here, so this could only allow HTTPS in, for example, front of the load balancer, have an NSG applied to a pair of um, MDAs, so again, could be web application firewall, maybe application gateway, then that would securely communicate only to the backend subnet. And for each tier, you can have secure rules to say they will only communicate with the next tier of the chain, so you can be very restrictive. Another example, so when we work with uh, local government, some government agencies and some corporations, they're really keen <coughs> because of compliance not to have any of their traffic hit the public internet. So in that scenario, we could have on premises networks. So it's a similar design that's going over private network architecture, it's not in the public internet. Mm-hmm. We could leverage Express Route, which essentially uses an NPS connection to a um, to a uh, an actual subscription directly. This will be terminated with a uh, virtual network gateway to terminate the MPS connection, and then, yeah, this connection is completely private. And we have some scenarios where maybe large organisations have multiple VNets due to acquisition, different subscriptions, all that good stuff. In a scenario where they need to keep the uh, traffic off the public internet, and not use site-to-site VPNs for these VNets, you can now use VNet peering. So towards the back here, where we have uh, a couple of different VNets here, you can utilize VNet peering to um, facilitate the traffic between the VNets. This actually uses Azure's backbone network. Uh, it doesn't actually go to the public internet. Cool, so we've got a few demos just to show you. I need to sit down for this. This is the Azure portal, portal.azure.com. <coughs> Excuse me, just to show you the. Uh, so, this is a. Uh, this is my actual account I use, but this is a um, sponsorship subscription, so there's nothing in production here, so I don't mind you seeing any of it. Um, we have the security sector. As I mentioned earlier, so I just want to show you some of the functionality of it. So, you get your, uh, your fancy score here. As you can see, this environment is not doing too well. Only 350 out of 780 here. You have a nice dashboard to give you an overview of your, your hygiene and compliance. So you can use this to give you a really good indication of how you're doing from a security perspective. And this doesn't just look at the end of virtual networks, but also data storage accounts, web applications, networking and platform services. So having a look at the recommendations, just to give you an example. So you can see here we have some recommendations to action. And if you are a security manager of an organisation, you know, it's a really good tool just to be able to, to take a look and have correct all of those, uh, those controls required. So we can see one of the biggest ones here is the fact that I don't have MFA or 2FA, however you want to see it, I call it configured for an account that's got own permission with my on my subscription. So just to explain that in a bit more detail, I appreciate all of you know how I just configured. We have my 
Azure Active Directory 10, this is a bit like on premises Active Directory, so we've got a bunch of users, groups, etc., registered applications. We can configure multi factor authentication for all of our accounts within here. Now, to actually access the resources, uh, we can have uh, roles of C groups to, to administer um, the environment in an appropriate way. If we look at our subscription, so all Azure resources need to reside within the subscription, that's how you pay for it. And within that, you have your resources within resource groups. So you can see we've got a couple here. So if we look at the subscription, and this is the same for every resource within the platform, you have access control. So at every single level, whether it's the subscription, the resource group, an individual resource, you have the ability to have specific role assignments that will, through decades, have been filtered down. So you can see we have a bunch of users here who aren't configured with MFA and they've got contributor and owner rights to the whole subscription. So with owner rights, it's basically got no you have the ability to do everything. Not ideal, but this is a, a test environment, so I'm kind of showing you what the kind of insight you can get from the service. If we just go back to Security Center. <coughs> And look at our vulnerabilities again. Um, we can even see that it's uh, saying I've got external accounts with only permissions on the subscription. So this is leveraging Azure AD B2B. So one of the great benefits of using Azure Apps Directory is because you can invite external user accounts in to access your resources securely. Um, and of course, because they've got own permission on the subscription, it's complaining that. As I mentioned a moment ago, so just in time, network access control is part of privileged identity management. So we can enable just in time access control for our engineers to access the resources they need without having those rules permanently in place, making everything a bit more secure. And a whole heap of stuff here. So it goes through absolutely everything. I won't go into this because we'll be here all day. But yeah, everything from vulnerability patches on, on virtual machines. Enabling auditing on SQL Server. So it does go through a whole raft of different scenarios. So just looking at a few more things. The score's broken down into category. So we have compute apps, networking, identity <coughs> access, and data. We have the ability to utilize uh, security policies, which are powered by um, Azure Policy. So you can have a policy applied to your subscription or resource group, whatever's appropriate, to say, you know, I don't want my users to provision virtual networks in this kind of configuration. And you can combine that with ARM templates to be able to give engineers a set template of how you want your security posture to look when you deploy resources. This is quite new, which is quite cool. So it's not very full at the moment, but you kind of get the idea. I think Microsoft's going to add more to this, but so I want to be ISO 21001 accredited. Well, within the portal, we've got all the controls here to tell us where we are compliant. So if you are a compliance manager and you're a cloud-first company, all you have to do is click on this and there you go. You get the direct support of, uh, of what you need to do to become compliant. There's only four at the moment. There's uh, yeah, PCR DSS and, and SOC PSP as well. Um, but yeah, there'll be, there'll be other more to do this as time goes on. So, yeah, some of this we've already covered, so I'm just going to skip over a few things. You've got security alerts, so, you know, going back to saying you know, about threat detection, so you can configure security alerts. I don't have any at the moment, obviously. Um, custom alerts and security alerts to give you that better insight and alerting on any vulnerabilities or, yeah, um, risks on the network as well. It's obviously not being created. So, just looking at uh, Azure Sentinel is a new service I mentioned a moment ago. So, I'll just show you what that looks like at the moment. <coughs> so, you can search for the portal. Here it is. It is a paid for service, but you get a free trial if you want to go in. So, you have um, workspaces available to store your logging information, etc., on your um, cloud environment. So this is the one that we've been using as part of the OMS suite. <coughs> so you can see here, so all of my virtual machines, my virtual networks, and, and all the resources within this cloud platform have been reporting into this, this repository. So you can see in the past 24 hours there's been 530 events. And these to be varied. Um, this is everything from uh, 
few examples uh, that we lost. We can do uh, a few queries here that says actually uh, the dashboard that you don't want. Uh, we can enable dashboards here. So I've already got three enabled. You can add more, but just to show you what that looks like, if I go back to my dashboards with an Azure, you can actually get the reports directly from the uh, dashboard. And if you're running like a, a SOC or a, or a NOC, that would be quite good to have on a little display or something. So from here, going back to what I was saying earlier, you can see the most frequent blog activities and what they are. So this is an extension here, no one's being enabled. Um, there's been some deletion of store points, so that is the recovery services folder, which does all the backups for the platform and deleting the store points, because probably because they're so old, they go out of the policy. Um, we have alerts around just-in-time network access policies, so that's been, that's been configured. So yeah, you have a visibility of everything that's going on on the cloud platform. So if we just look at the SQL databases as an example, just to show you a couple of features. So this is an Azure SQL platform service. Um, there's sometimes in, in the customers who have those requirements around compliance and things like that, they aren't keen on adopting platform services because there's a public endpoint there. But there's something called service endpoints now, so you can logically wrap a platform service solution like Azure SQL in a virtual network, and you can find out with the firewall. So yeah, it minimizes the, the attack risk. Um, so that's available as part of uh, Azure SQL storage and many other, many, many other uh, resources as well. Take a SQL example, there's a whole heap of inbuilt solutions from a security perspective that you can adopt. So here, the on state security, so I actually look at the columns and, and, and the labeling of the, the actual data in the SQL database and pull back on that. You have auditing, which you can enable by default. That's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, it's off, uh, but yeah, you can put it on, and that will audit everything into a storage account and log analytics. So you can even put that back into an event hub and use Azure Sentinel to report on that as well. Dynamic data masking is enabled as well. If you have the requirement to mask the rows or columns within your database, you can just turn that on from here. And of course, PD encryption is enabled by default now, so that will just be on. And with Azure SQL, again, picking this as, as an example, uh, for the standard tier up was by default, you get point in time restore back 35 days at any point in time. So if you had an event where you got hacked and they delete your data, you can securely restore that. And the Azure Recovery Services vaults are typically geo-replicated by default. So going back to what I was saying earlier about paired regions, you can have a backup of your data in a complete separate region. Within Active Directory, this is where you configure conditional access. So I don't think this will actually last as well. It's not to change. So in here, in conditional access, I can have a policy to say I'm not going to allow anyone to access my, my Azure portal unless they're from a trusted device, uh, their needs list of users, and they're using MFA. So that's where you can see this here. There's a baseline one available for free. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a whole heap of things you can do. A lot of controls and depth is very, very granular. So, thank you. Is there any questions?